Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in for this exciting discussion on travel and tourism as part of the second annual Building the Future Summit. Tourism has seen a massive impact lately, but for sure has pushed the industry to rethink its services. In our panel today, we're joined by some inspiring leaders from a broad spectrum within the travel industry, and we will discuss more about future experiences and technology in this session today. Of course, joining us today for this discussion are Jerry Inzarello, the Group Chief Executive Officer for Diria Gate Development Authority, Basma Al Maiman, uh, who is the Regional Director of the Middle East for World Tourism Organization. We've got Sharif Bashara, the Group CEO of Mohammed and Ubaid Al Mullah Group of Companies, and of course, Philip Boyne, the Chief Executive Officer at Forbes Travel Guide. Thank you everyone for being with us here today. Um, getting straight into the questions, Basma, uh, we've seen UAE report the highest levels of occupancy over the past couple of months in hotels. And I was at the Dubai airport a couple of weeks back as well, and I overheard one of the senior staff members talk to another passenger that we're checking in over 10,000 passengers right now. From a macro regional perspective, how has the recovery been, especially when we see countries like Qatar hosting sporting events, Saudi hosting some really impressive concerts and, and other events in addition to the Riyadh season and Dubai pouring in with all of these tourists in, in their most awaited season of the year? Uh, thank you. Well, um, um, our role, um, you know, uh, at the since the um, pandemic uh, started, uh, we had um, um, uh, some of the uh, initiatives for uh, to recover um, uh, tourism. Um, um, as you probably know, the the uh, UNWTO started a um, uh, global crisis, uh, tourism crisis uh, committee, and um, which is. Uh, comprised of the UNWTO member states and um, uh, our partners and in the international um, as international organizations and from the uh, private sector. Um, we uh, adopted um, uh, through the uh, through the committee, um, two strategic uh, guidance um, documents, and uh, also we had recommendations to um, have a coordinated ap approach for safe uh, travel. Um, also, um, uh, during the last uh, regional commission for the Middle East, which was held in, in Riyadh, the Middle East uh, member states uh, agreed on harmonizing safety and health uh, protocols uh, to, to resume tourism and to facilitate uh, travel. And um, as um, you can see, I mean, the... Uh, with each wave of the of the pandemic, the the um, the restrictions uh, change, but uh, we still in the region try to um, uh, to to harmonize our um, our procedures. Um, we've been tr uh, tracking also the uh, the num uh, the numbers of. Um, uh, whether it's uh, travelers or um, uh, or the actions that have been uh, taken through uh, creating a UNWTO uh, and uh, IATA destination um, uh, tracker. Um, also, uh, you know, with the now with the expo in um, in, in in Dubai, uh, I mean, this is something that. Um, uh, we all uh, work together in, uh, um, and, uh, you know, trying to, to be, in, you know, in, involved, uh, in, in whether virtually or, uh, you know, in person, um, and increase the number of, uh, you know, uh, of, of travelers within the region, at least. All right, Sharif, the, the group owns Holiday Inn franchises here, and, and I think you'll be in in the best position to answer the same question I asked Basma. How do you see this recovery and was this anticipated and, and how do you feel the public-private partnerships have supported this recovery? Uh, thanks so much for your question. Uh, first of all, let's highlight that we really at the, at the hotel owners we are so lucky was in Dubai and UAE because during the yes. pandemic has not affected as the rest of the world. We can say because of the vision, it's all about vision and planning. If the, if the regime and the government have the right vision, 
and right planning and pre-planning, they have the right strategy and action to be taken. During the pandemic, the hospitality sector hasn't been affected as the rest of the world for a very simple reason. The first one, the support that we got it from the government. Second, the utilization and the conversion of the hotels that has been shifted to institutional isolations. Okay, so it, it's utilized. Yes. After the after the pandemic, or actually during the pandemic, we can say at the rest of the world, Dubai closed for a few weeks. Then immediately Dubai is open again to the rest of the world. So Dubai was the first destination to open the truth for the rest of the world. So the hotel industry has recovered, I think, so fast. The trust that Dubai and UAE put on the tourism all over the world, the first destination, the people feel trust and safe to come, it's Dubai. And that's reflected the public-private uh, partnership concept that the leaders yeah. of UAE put, uh, uh, put it on the culture of the country. PPP, till now, there's an existing of 65 billion existing uh, PPP and recently they announced 25 billion. There are a huge example of public-private partnership. When you are going to a meeting with anyone in, in the government and his first comment that we don't want to compete with private sector, we want to promote private sector. And we in Mohammed al Abel al-Mullah, we own a good portfolio of hotels between our five stores and budget hotels, not only Hodain Express. The, the, the support that us and the rest of the hotel owners got it from the government of UAE and Dubai, it's incredible. Um, Jerry, from a different perspective, because things are quite different for you. We've seen the global pandemic, uh, subsequent economic shock have had major impact on the hospitality and tourism industry. What impact has it had on Diria's development and how has DZDA managed it? Well, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm super happy to be with you, Daniel, and thank you uh, for the great leadership that Forbes is doing in the Middle East. And let me reiterate that to be with my wonderful uh, beloved colleague, Philippe Boyan, and to be with Bosma and Sharif is a great pleasure for me. We're very fortunate in the kingdom, like our brothers and sisters in the Emirates, because in the Gulf, there's phenomenal leadership. And that leadership has been steady for the last three years in terms of how we've handled the pandemic. What's also unique to the kingdom is that under the leadership of the custodian of the two holy mosques, His Majesty King Salman, we treated everybody, whether they were foreigner or re residents, uh, with full medical, full of vaccinations. So we've managed it very well. But with our dynamic crown prince, nothing changed. All the funding, for a $50 billion giga project um, has maintained on, on schedule. So when we open back up for tourism, that we're ready to go, he never backed off. So we actually, during COVID, um, and especially working online, we actually lost no time. And um, with Vision 2030, Derea will be the, one of the first giga projects in the world that will open assets in 2022, groundbreak assets and announce new assets every year between now and 2030. So we, because of the Crown Prince's vision, with the non-interruption of any resources, we've stayed on time. The other thing is that there was no cutback at all with the Saudi Tourism Authority, which means that when we opened up the Kingdom for Tourism in September of 1990, to protect the society, we had to shut it down in um, March of uh, uh, 2020. But now we're ready and everything is go. So uh, we were very lucky because we had that same continuity uh, of dynamic leadership. Philip, you guys champion luxury, or as you say, we verify luxury. Um, it's interesting to know, you know how you have traveled to over 300 luxury hotels and before, that's before the pandemic, of course, and I'm sure the number would not have seen a significant improvement over the past two years. But tell us a little bit more about how do you compare your experiences as a customer experience changing from compared to before and after the pandemic? Has it become more bespoke and, and more personalized? 
Yeah, very good question, Daniel. And first of all, uh, delighted to cooperate with Forbes Middle East and with my distinguished panelists, and especially Jerry, of course, who paved the way for me in Forbes Travel Guide through all his amazing work there. Um, yes, uh, I have visited 300 hotels. Jerry, I'm not going to ask you how many because you're going to embarrass me, right? Um, but in general, um, Average daily rates, as you very well know in Dubai, are much higher than before the pandemic, and so are the guest expectations. Um, our rated hotels tell us that luxury travelers in the recovery are unforgiving and that they expect and demand what they pay for. And that is extraordinary service delivery. We need to know every guest will have slightly different expectations and preferences. So it is important that service is even more intuitive and anticipatory than before. Maintenance, maintaining service standards is going to be the key going forward. Because let's not forget after the frustration and the isolation that all the travelers have experienced over the last two years, they want to feel again. They want to feel safe. They want that human connection. And they want to feel truly cared for. In Forbes Travel Guide, we always say, every time we make our guests work or think harder, luxury disappears. And for me, great service is about the small, gracious, and personalized touches. For example, the waiter at the Plaza Athene in Paris, that is a Dorchester hotel, who during a meeting whispers in my ear, Mr. Boyan, your cappuccino must be cold by now. So I prepared you a fresh one. I mean, that's amazing. I didn't have to call for his attention. I didn't have to wave my arms around. That is anticipatory service. The handwritten card in my bathroom at Raffles Istanbul that said, I noticed that your toothpaste was running out. So I took the liberty of replacing it with the same brand. That sort of action gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling that you are truly, truly cared for. And what I see traveling around the world in those luxury hotels, every time I experience extraordinary service, it is enjoyed as much by the person delivering it than by the person receiving it. Service needs to be natural, spontaneous. We need to let the employees be themselves. Authentic language, not scripted. It takes confidence for employees to do that. And to grow confidence, employees need training because guests love to connect with personalities and characters. Well, I think it's, it's really interesting to know how the customer experience going hand in hand with the technology and the digital innovation, and at the same time, sustainability being the top priority for you guys. I think that's that's a, something well done and, and I'm sure it's going to be very well received. Um, Sharif, just, just coming back to you, I think again from, like you mentioned, you guys operate a lot of hotel chains here from, from Holiday Inn to all the others. Uh, could you highlight the latest innovations and tools that you have adopted or you have been adopting to deliver an enhanced customer experience at your hotel chains? First of all, uh, I think that COVID shouldn't take us from the same purpose for the guest that we should make the guest experience better, not just safer. Because everyone right now is panicked that uh, the passenger or the, our guest is, uh, he want to feel safe and he's panicked from the pandemic and COVID and all of that. So let's return back for his main issues before the pandemic. What he used to suffer before the pandemic. The guest or the traveler, he required a very simple personalized trip personalized package this first second but let's talk first on the innovation part. the innovation part that we succeed to implement it on Halutain in express and it's on the final it chases is the keyless that enter you doing the online check-in then you receive your key and you can go back to your room that is almost done and accept just we are on the final uh, stage uh, we just requested approval and we will implement it immediately Okay, second, to implement and personalize, for example, your housekeeping during an app to planning for you, uh, your room cleaning. Okay, for the innovation, because we also uh, own a travel agency there. So we're working with the startup right now in Germany, okay, for the first uh, local 
AI friend in fact. That's your friend that you will start talking with him. He will he will analyze your emotion. He'll understand your emotions. Once you step in, in, in Dubai, he can uh, understand whether from your emotion, whether you're sad, uh, you are happy, you are uh, you, uh, you're hungry, you, where you want to, to eat, and based on your experience, okay, and based on the data that you will start to collect it, I will start to predict on future, okay, what's what what you need in certain area. So we work right now. We implement that the first city within Dubai, then uh, and UAE as a country. Then we need to uh, provide that to the rest of the world. So it will be the first AI local friend in your pocket that you can talk to him, ask him, get his opinion on the uh, selected country or city. Well, they say experience is what will be deciding factor for many travelers in the future. So, I, and I'm, I quite agree with, with what Philip you've just mentioned. Jerry, coming back to you, um, like you mentioned the, the first Giga project, uh, I wanted to talk more about it. What measures is DGDA taking to ensure a seamless experience for its visitors? Yeah, well, we're, again, we're very fortunate because a lot of the planning that we did um, three, four years ago in terms of what are the new trends, what are guests looking for, had to also pre-exist with the goals of the kingdom, especially that of the crown prince on environmental protection, sustainability in terms of um, new forms of energy. So what we did during the COVID is we've upgraded all our technology where uh, the guests can have a very seamless digital experience. So now when you come and even visit the UNESCO World Heritage Site, you can book your restaurant online, you can book your parking, you can book your UNESCO tour. So we, the kingdom is making everything extremely user-friendly from um, a technology point of view, but that's also very good because we've upgraded, we're, we're in the process of upgrading the entire kingdom in terms of environmental protection, sustainability, new sources of water, um, sewerage, power, all new, all new forms of uh, um, energy other than just the fossil fuel. So we've spent a lot of time analyzing roads, electric vehicles, um, of the UNESCO site and Derea, we're planning 40,000 parking spots. They're all underground, all carbon neutral. So we're, we're ready to open up um, a guest experience in a very beautiful country, very diversified country. And uh, where initially, as quickly as 2023, there'll be over 100 things to do in the kingdom. Basma, uh, coming back to what Philip was mentioning about training and education, how do you see this specific service improving the quality of the overall tourism sector? And, and do you feel like uh, the experience-based travel is going to be important? How is the World Tourism Organization working on, with its members and affiliate, affiliates on such aspects? Well, um, uh, since the pandemic started, actually the training methods and in, 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 in tourism also um, uh, changed. We started uh, adapting, uh, maybe just like other um, uh, sectors, the hybrid uh, format. Um, in um, in U N W T O, we um, uh, created. Um, um, a platform. Uh, so far, we have 15,000 students who are enrolling in um, uh, ready-made courses um, um, online and in different UN uh, languages and in cooperation with uh, high-ranking universities. Um, also, um, as you probably heard, the Saudi Council of uh, Ministers um, recently approved the establishment of um, uh, inter international Tourism Academy in uh, collaboration with UNWTO. Um, this is by far, um, it's going to be the largest um, uh, training um, uh, center for tourism worldwide. And it's, uh, it has a, a, a very special um, a structure and hopefully um, we will start um, um, soon. Also, we have... Um, 
a dedicated um, online resources website where um, um, uh, the, um, our, um, our guests can access our um, uh, e-library, online academy, all the publications and journals uh, written in, in, in tourism. We also created um, a UNWTO Students League. Um, we had uh, two challenges uh, in 2021. Um, it was the pl plastic and um, rural development. Um, the winners from the from the Middle East uh, were all girls from Oman and um, and Lebanon. Um, so I think the um, uh, there are things that we started during the pandemic that will continue uh, becoming a, a regular uh, practice, and uh, there is a high demand now on um, uh, online training, and this is what we're working on now. Oh, that's good. That's good to know that there's so much of uh, things coming up and all the partnerships that you guys are doing to ensure the, the education is, is being delivered. And I'll come back to this point uh, later during the conversation about the, uh, about the, 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 the female participants at the, or the winners that you just mentioned. But just going back to uh, Philip, uh, Philip, of course, Forbes Travel Guide, everybody knows about you guys. Do you also advise hotels on how to improve their services and quality and experiences? Uh, do you work with tourism boards to elevate the service levels of hotels to boost the tourism sector? Tell us a little bit more about, about those services of yours. Yeah, Daniel, um, Forbes Travel Guide is the only independent rating agency. <clears throat> We're currently operating in 72 countries and we complete more than 3000 evaluations every year. So basically, um, we work with hotels, restaurants, and spas. And recently, we have started to work with tourism councils, tourism ministries in various destinations. And what we've created with them together, and also with their hotel and restaurant associations, is a Forbes Travel Guide Star Journey. These are destinations that want to improve the level of quality, the level of service, um, to put their destination in better light and to attract more luxury clients and obviously more revenues for tourism in general. So what does the Star Journey include? It includes a program, and usually this program, we do it from three to five years because obviously it takes time to, um, to evaluate, first of all, a, a destination and then to create a luxury level, it doesn't happen uh, overnight. So what we do is in the program, we have in-person training, virtual and virtual service excellence training and leadership training, which is of, of course very important. We do quality inspections and evaluations of most hotels and restaurants in the destination. And we don't only do luxury hotels. We do the whole sphere of five-star, four-star, and three-star hotels because it's important in the destination that every level of the hotel industry is brought up to quality, right? And of course, the destination can promote the partnership with Forbes Travel Guide. And the objective is to improve the overall quality of service and experiences offered in that destination. And there by enhancing the perception and the attraction of the country with consumers, high-end travelers, and travel agencies. Well, I, I think independent ratings is what the world reads right now, um, in addition to a lot of other things. But hey, how difficult is it to get five stars from Forbes Travel? Um, it is pretty, <laughs> pretty darn difficult, uh, Daniel. <laughs> For the moment, we have 282 five-star hotels. You will be glad to know that five of them are in Dubai. Um, and, and this is out of the more than 2,000 hotels that we evaluate every year. So in Dubai, we have the Bulgari, of course, we have the Burj Al Arab, we have the two Four Seasons, and also the Mandarin Oriental. How difficult is it? 75% of our standards measure the emotional aspects of service. That's what makes it so difficult. It's all about how do you make your guests feel in your hotel, right? We have also a training academy of 20 trainers. And it was interesting to listen to Basma, what she was saying. 
right after the start of COVID, we, <clears throat> we changed all our in-person training to virtual training, of course. And today we are back to 90% in-person training because the impact of in-person connections is so much stronger than virtual training. And the connection with the trainer and the employees, or the leaders that they are trainer, training is incredibly strong. So coming back, um, what does it take to be a five-star hotel? I would say total commitment to quality. I would say consistency because every interaction in the hotel between any member of staff and the guest needs to be absolutely perfect and perseverance. It takes a lot of perseverance and it has to be the leadership that is behind this quest for quality. Otherwise it's not going to work. Absolutely. I think I, I really agree with what you said and, and from a personal experience as well. Um, I was traveling to Qatar a couple of months back uh, for one of our events and, and I had a very bad experience at, at one of the very famous international chains and that was just a check-in experience that I had and but I really like how they came, they covered it up later on you know I, I got handwritten notes um, they, they had like chocolates with my name printed on it so so I like that that personal touch to that experience that they gave me of course it's kind of covering up from what they did wrong. But anyhow, I, I really feel like sometimes we come across hotels and chains where they don't even own up if there is a mistake on their behalf. Um, and, and this was really interesting. So yeah, I, kind, I, I truly agree with you. Um, Jerry, coming back to you from, from a perspective of now the industry is, is, has recovered, do you envision a new kind of tourism to emerge from this? And, and how do you see, what form will this take? Yeah, I, you know, a lot of people are talking is, uh, will, will the severity of a three-year COVID um, really change everything? And it, it, my view is that it won't change human, human behavior. And human behavior has always had the need to interact. It's always had the need to share an experience. So, but what COVID did do is that now, um, in the short term, you have a much more intense guest um, a much a much more um, bottled up guest. So you're seeing that play out short term on uh, all different kinds of disruptions on air, airports and airplanes. A lot of guest dissatisfaction. Um, some of the owners have really uh, uh, taken posture to really, really uh, price gouge. I think that that's a very, very uh, short sighted big mistake. If to try and get back some of their margins, they they accelerate their rate structure, you know, forty to one hundred percent normally than what it is. But I think I think the bigger picture is that people are going to look for authenticity. They're going to look for encounters that are real. They are going to definitely look for more outdoor experiences because uh, people really found a love of different cultures and heritages and outside. I think everybody realizes with the COVID that it didn't matter what country you were in. We were all in this together. Everybody, um, everybody knew the same kind of pain in pretty much every country, even the countries like the Gulf that handled it very well. So I anticipate that there's going to be um, 12 months, and that's not understanding what new variants could be, but, but there's going to be a, at least a year more. Uh, of an adjustment period out of this that may have some extreme behavior. But I think that um, the travel is going to boom again. We already saw it before the Omnicon came. And uh, now we just have to be very careful that we're sensitive, that, that, that we're responsive and, and not price gouging, that there's good value because the guests are not going to tolerate anything less than that. Yeah, and, and, and quite agree with this. I think it's, it has to be more than just a stay at a place or just visiting a hotel or a country. You know, it, it, at the end of the day, like we were talking earlier on, experiences, not only from a perspective, I believe, of experience in the hotel with the staff, but I really feel they have to go beyond that and create more intuitive or interactive experiences, as they say. So I, I, I quite agree with this. Um, I Sharif, think also, if you, if you allow me, also sure, sure, from, sure. from the guest's uh, perspective, uh, the way um, hotel guests uh, are um, assessing hotels now um, after the uh, travel uh, 
restarted um, since the pand um, pandemic, uh, it has changed the way you assess the hotel services, guest services. Uh, when you're a to tourist now, you're more you're more demanding for for better services, for uh, you know health protocols, all these things, and that didn't exist before. So I believe also um, the the assessment of the accommodation uh, sector, if we're talking about hotels or rural lodges, or uh, it has to be reviewed also. Yeah, no, I think it, we, we've become a little bit of a demanding tourist and maybe Sharif can, Sharif can talk more about that. But um, Sharif, I'd, I'd, I'd like to come to you from, from a slightly different angle as well, which is kind of uh, complementary, I would say as well. Um, as you manage the American hospitals as well as all the hospitality chains that you have, how do you see medical tourism changing and how do you see that exchange of experiences on both sides? So before going to medical tourism, just l l let me add uh, something written to the previous question that uh, Jerry and Basma uh, talk about and what the guest experience and talk from the guest perspective. The, the important element for any customer service, it's a personal touch. Your people within the premises should be happy. Your staff should be happy before they start passing the happiness to your guest, especially yeah. after the pandemic. People and a lot of the staff, we get treated them and we, we provide them the mental support. It's not that easy for those people. So that's, let's take care of our people between the hotel and the staff and they will take care of your guest. Let's back to the medical tourism. Medical tourism, it's a, then it's, it's a type of tourism. It's a tourism for medical. The tourism in Dubai, Dubai is a, one of the busiest for tourism all over the world. What's on the other hand to provide the medical tourism is the medical by the healthcare provider and the patient care. Yeah. What we discovered at the Mola Group because we're holding both verticals, the hospitality and the healthcare the connection, the connectivity between both sectors. There is a loop between both sectors that are not connected together. American hospital, we have a connections or, uh, at many countries, we get patients from many countries, but if yeah. we don't have that connections, we never provide the right medical tourist packages. So the medical tourists very simply need to close the loop between the medical and the hospitality in industry. And they need to start talk together. And the medical tourists, there are many categories. As in the tourism, you have from the five star to budget, same in medical. So what we are trying to do right now, we're trying to set up a medical tourism agency in a number of countries. That medical tourism agency is start providing a comprehensive packages, provide the benefits, for mm -hmm. the patient and his family and, and allocate him at the healthcare facility based on his category, what he required. So how we can do all of that and combine all of that, we work on, on, on a platform and solution right now. We have it, it will be through an app connected, that, like an AI doctor connected to many healthcare provider, American hospital, as of then American hospitals that cover certain categories and connected to the other hotels from the budget till uh, luxury hotels. So simply at the end, we need to close that loop. Absolutely, I think that's, that's amazing. I think uh, that, uh, I think, and also it was previously brought on as well. I think it's, it's again, at the end of the day, closing in that loop and making sure, I think the transfer of experiences is pretty similar and you are managing both of these sectors, you know, at the same time. So there's a lot of exchange of expertise and, and, and care that needs to be taken. Um, exactly. And for the PPP right now, we're working for the, with the government also to implement yeah, yeah. the same model that we done it by, by American Hospital and yeah. Mola with the Dubai Healthcare Authority and uh, the other authorities to work all together to find a, a proper model to be implemented for the whole city. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Good, good luck with that, and, and I really hope that that kind of gets through and, and is 
making and creating the impact that's needed. Um, Philip, coming back to you, I think we, we're all talking about the experiences, personalized experiences. Uh, Sharif earlier on talk, spoke about the, uh, the, the intuitive and the interactive AI technology that they are now leveraging to create a more personalized experience for their travelers. How do you think technology and innovation can actually help this and, and how can perhaps maybe like we were discussing earlier on a touch of local cultures add more value for the travels, make it more experiential travels, you know, and like I said earlier on, not just to stay at the hotel. Yeah, that's an interesting question because for me, very clearly, there is no system or platform that will ever replace the emotional aspects of personal interaction. Right. So for me, luxury hospitality will always be about high touch rather than high tech. Obviously, during COVID, uh, hotels have been concentrating and focusing on acquiring their clients directly. So they've obviously leveraged the powers of the power of their loyalty programs, their website, social media platforms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Technology, I think, is key and it can help us tremendously when we collect data and when we try and know our guests and their preferences better, because that finally allows us to offer an even more seamless experience on property for that guest. A lot of companies have adopted chatbots to facilitate on property communication services with guests and staff. I think personal interaction needs to be always and will always be maintained, but the transactional elements can be reduced. For example, there is still the issue in a hotel where the first thing a receptionist will ask the guest after welcoming him, of course, is for his credit card. I mean, we don't have that issue with Amazon. We don't have that issue with Apple. Why can't we in the hotel the first thing that a guest should hear when he comes to a hotel is, welcome, Mr. Jones. Let me escort you to your room, right? Yeah. It, it should not be, can I take an imprint of your credit card or can I? <laughs> I mean, and I feel very strong about it. And this is where technology can be used in a way to create an even more seamless experience for the clients, right? And when it comes to community, I think community is becoming more important. Um, the traveler is becoming more curious. The traveler is becoming more responsible. Um, and we know from our hotels that they are starting to ask questions. They're starting to ask, how is my stay impacting the community? Yeah. What are you giving back to the community? Are you using local staff? Are you um, using a local supply chain? Are the restaurant, are your restaurant menus dictated by local seasonal produce? What are we giving back to the community, etc.? And then it needless to say that the cooperation or the integration of the hotel into the community is hugely important. Don't forget that all the celebrations, all the special events that members in the community have, wouldn't you like them to be at your hotel? These are clients that are always be there, that will always be there, will always be around you. And the hotel should be a hub for the local community because yeah. the guest that stays in your hotel is only there for, the, for one night or two nights. The community is there forever. So I think that the other thing is that employees play a very important role in letting the guest discover the local way of life. Employees yeah. should be knowledgeable. Their language should reflect the community, their behavior, their uniforms. All of that helps to create that sense of place, which is what guests want today. They want to discover the destination. And we as hoteliers, we are facilitators to make sure that they can experience the best the destination has to offer. That's 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 absolutely true. And I and I learned a new thing. It's going to be luxury touch and not tech. Just maybe for the luxury end. <laughs> um, 
I think the, the, the last point that I want to cover with Basma, and again, it's, it's, it's a topic that's part of all of our conversations, and rightly so as well. That there's a heavy focus internally for us on this topic as well. Basma, could you highlight a little bit more about the gender diversity um, issues that are being taken up at the WTO, and how are you facilitating and encouraging inclusion of women in the tourism sector in MENA region at all levels? Well, um, uh, of course, part of our work at the UNWTO is to make sure that uh, we're implementing SDG 5 in the, in the tourism uh, sector. Uh, recently, we, we launched, we published a regional report on uh, women in tourism in the Middle East. It was published with the um, uh, support of the Ministry of Tourism in Saudi Arabia during the um, uh, um, Sa uh, Saudi Arabia's presidency of the G20. And uh, we discovered that um, uh, in, th in the Middle East region, we have 8% uh, of, of women uh, who are working in the uh, tourism uh, sector compared to 16% um, um, uh, um, of their involvement in the um, overall economy in the region. Whereas um, uh, globally, we have 54% um, of the pe people wor um, working in tourism are women, compared to 39% of the overall uh, global economy. Now, from, for, from my point of uh, view, as someone who um, who's, has worked in the region and uh, in tourism and comes from the region and comes from tourism, uh, uh, our numbers, um, uh, they probably, I mean, they're not very high, but uh, they're, they're much, much higher than uh, what, we, what, what we know of today. Uh, we have um, many jobs that, whether it's direct jobs or in, in, indirectly uh, um, uh, tourism, considered as tourism jobs, where women are um, dominating um, uh, this uh, sector. Uh, we have countries like Egypt, like Jordan, and I think the number could be uh, much higher um, uh, than that. Uh, however, um, uh, to to um, have more and um, uh, to encourage women in the um, uh, everywhere to, to uh, contribute more to the tourism sector. We uh, launched a uh, pilot program, it's called the Center Stage. Um, it's uh, with cooperation of the um, GIS, uh, the agency in, um, in Germany. And it's uh, with the aim to provide more opportunities for women to work in tourism. And so far we have, um, Four member states in this pilot program, and Jordan from the Middle East is uh, is, is uh, one of them. Um, I well, mean, uh, that's 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 great. I think I, I really hope and I really believe. You know, this this topic is really important for us. It, it's important to have this uh, this inclusiveness, this this diversity, and we need to bring this more out in the region. The, the region has progressed on a lot of angles, and in and gender diversity across the region has improved significantly and we can see even Saudi has been at the forefront of the of the of the improvement that's that everyone is seeing and I really hope you know that all of us on the call today especially you all who are, who are working directly in the in the sector are able to drive more change and, and improve the numbers from from what you just mentioned uh, Basma and, and we're able to take it to global standards as well um, with that I'd, I'd like to wrap up, wrap up the the session for today Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thank you, speakers, for joining in. I really appreciate the time that you all have taken out of these very busy schedules, but sharing with us more about how the experience is going to change the travel sector, how technology is going to change the travel sector, um, how experiential travel, which requires more than just a hotel stay. And like Jerry mentioned, I think it's important. It's going to be important for hotels and, every, and all the tourist destinations to give an experience beyond just the hotel. Uh, Jerry, we wish you very good luck with the DGTA's projects and the announcements. And uh, similar, I, I, I wish good luck to you, Sharif, for, for all of your amazing work that you're doing in the, in the partnerships space as well. And Philip, I really hope that you can host me at the Las Vegas Summit uh, this year. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate everyone. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank, thank you, you so much, Jerry. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone.